Good morning and blessings, brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a joy to be here, standing in front of you. I give honor to God, to Pastor Blackman, to Brian, to the breakaway cabinet, to faculty and staff as colleagues, to you as my brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for choosing, because it is a choice every day, to worship the Lord. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you because, Lord, we can come before you and understand what it is to, to know who our neighbor is and to walk in humility and to learn in humility from that neighbor. Lord, may you direct our time together now. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord. May you direct this time for it's in your name, all the saints said. We often learn through the process of mistakes. We get humbled by things that we do that we think it's going to be perfect, and then suddenly we realize, oops, that didn't quite go the way I thought it was going to. I remember this time, senior year in high school, it is a chapel, and I was asked, I went to a Christian school, and I was asked to lead a song, and we were singing the song, Amen. Y'all know it, Amen. Y'all know it, right? Amen. Let me hear you. Amen, amen, amen. Sing it over, sing a little louder. Sing it to the Lord now. Amen, amen, amen. Now that chapel was great. They were a little bit more rowdy than you. Maybe it was a little bit, you know, later in the day, they were a little bit more wide awake. But it was fascinating. Everyone was engaged. We were clapping. We were all having a good time. It went so well that the school asked me next week to lead singing again. And I said, well, yeah, sure, no problem. And the next week came, and that morning they gave me what we were supposed to sing. Um, one ought never to say yes to something that you don't quite know what it is. Because at that particular point in time, I had never heard the hymn, And Can It Be? I, that's what I remembered, Brian. I didn't know what the heck that was, and here I was standing up and suddenly supposed to lead everybody. What's the word? Fortunately for me, the only thing that helped was that my dear sister Carol Larson came up, stood beside me, and started singing it with me. When we got us into the song, and we actually were able to sing it well. I learned from that never ever to say yes to something until I know really what it is I'm being asked to do. Because you look awful stupid when you're six foot, at that time only six foot four, and at that time, only 220 pounds, you know, 200 pounds. Anyway, um, and when you really look bad. But I also learned that, okay, there's some things that I can grow from this. I was asked to talk about who is my neighbor learning through humility. It's connected to breakaway, but it's kind of beyond breakaway. So I'll start with a passage of scripture that I think many of us know very well. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? The Lord replied, how do you read it? Because that's where the Lord sounds, cool and mellow. What is written in the law? How do you read it? <laughs> well, the man, you know, trying to throw off that he's smart, said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But the man, you know, was feeling good about himself, so he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and <laughs> who is my neighbor? Now he thought he caught him. Ha. <laughs> In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down to Jerusalem from Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going along down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, now pause here. We all are Wheaton students, and we understand that this is a group of people that was hated a, a good Jewish person would look at a Samaritan and at best spit and, you know, at least go in the other direction. This is not somebody that they're going to expect. So when he hears a Samaritan as he traveled, 
came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Who is my neighbor? Now, the lawyer was trying to trick Jesus, and it's one of those conversations that we don't completely understand at first. But obviously, the lawyer was feeling pretty good about himself when he first posed the question. Whatever the lawyer had in mind for an answer, though, what Jesus said was not where he was headed. And sometimes, to be honest, it's not what we expect either. We all know this parable, but sometimes it's a little confusing. Because in the end, Jesus says the Samaritan, the man who helped him, proved to be the neighbor. So here we are, along with the lawyer, trying to figure out what we are supposed to do, who we are supposed to love. And Jesus turns the question around. Look at the man who acts in mercy. Stop asking who is my neighbor, because there's a much deeper question that we should ponder. As John Piper explains, when we are, doing, when we are done trying to establish, is this my neighbor? The decisive issue of love remains, what kind of person am I? Who are you? That's the question. Are we going to be like this uh, person who is hated, despised, and horrible, who gives help when it's needed to a person that he knows will never actually respond to him? Or are we going to be caught up in questions about what we're supposed to do and who we're supposed to help and what happens when I'm a little late? And if I'm with that person, won't I be considered as unclean, impure, improper? What grounds the way that we think about neighbors is actually our identity, not theirs. What matters first is who we are. In his book, The Union with Christ, Todd Billings holds, builds on Calvin's teachings. I had to stick Calvin in for our dear pastor. Um, Calvin's teaching on the double grace of justification and sanctification. Now, of course, I'm going to get it wrong, and he'll correct me when we're done. Don't worry. He explains that when we are made new in Christ, we receive forgiveness of sins and Christ's righteousness. We are saved from God's wrath, and we are also received new life by the Spirit. We are saved to fellowship with God and with others. This is a radical truth, because in Christ we are given the right standing before God, which is justification. We are propelled in love for God and others by the new power of his spirit in us, which is sanctification. We are understanding what grace is, that we are not getting what we deserve. Excuse me, grace is that we are getting what we don't deserve, and mercy not getting what we really do deserve. This affects the way that we see those around us, not only because they've become something different, but because we have. The people around us are uniquely created in our Lord's image. And the transforming work of this commission has set us on a path of good works so that we can serve the Lord. And on this path, we realize that the people are real, full of real lives, real stories, real issues. And these are our neighbors. But more importantly, we are neighbors. Notice that the lawyer asked this question, who is my neighbor? And, and this is important because lawyers tend to ask these types of questions. Well, who, how, why? No disrespect to those of you who are going to be lawyers at some point in time. I may need one of you to help ask that who, how, and why, and to prove that I didn't do. But what he is trying to do is, uh, I'm sorry. The, what he is trying to do is set out that he understands. But Jesus goes and does something completely different at the end. He doesn't ask who was the Samaritan's neighbor. Rather, he asks who acted like a neighbor. He doesn't ask why. He just says who did what is right. The answer, of course, is obvious to the lawyer and to us, the Samaritan who went out of his way to help another. But do you notice how this changes things? 
which raises an interesting and often uncomfortable question. Not so much who's our neighbor, but who has been a neighbor to us. You see, in the 21st century, we are taught everything in this country about being self-sufficient, being on your own, being the great one that you are, and not that we're supposed to depend on other people. You and and I, as brothers and sisters in Christ, hear this voice that often tells us that we are supposed to be great in our own selves and not that we're supposed to have need for others. But what we're looking at is the uncomfortableness of being in need of others. Sometimes it's a fear of being a burden or a concern that we may owe somebody else if we let them do something for us. Or we're afraid to be vulnerable because if we show our need and that need may not be met. Whatever the reason is, many of us are absolutely mortified of the idea of showing our deepest needs to others. And frankly, we sometimes have a hard time of receiving. But the Lord is good, and his mercies endure forever. And the Lord has a funny way of teaching us things. So I started with my senior year in high school. I'm going to fast forward to now to my freshman year in college, a whole year later. Um, I came to Wheaton as a freshman from Philadelphia. I was told by friends that you can always jump around from church to church to church. So choose a church home, make that your home, have people there who know you, and then visit other churches from that. But have a consistent place. So I did that. After a couple Sundays at a couple churches, I went to the Wheaton Evangelical Free Church. I said, it's not exactly like home, nothing like home. It was not a black Baptist church. But hey, I understood what was happening. I enjoyed the service, so I said, I'm going to make this my home. My first Sunday there, I met this little girl who had broken her arm and was in a cast. And I talked to her, and she said, well, she's a little cheerleader, and she is in eighth grade, and she had fallen, and that's how her arm was in a cast. And I pray, oh, girl, I pray that your arm <laughs> heals quickly. We start the process of going a couple more weeks, and the the church has a college student adoption program. I put my name in to be adopted. I go to the gym to the day that we are selecting the families. And it sort of felt awkward because I was always the fat kid that was never picked. You know, when you have the kid with a cast and an eye patch and and, and a broken arm and me, and the person who's choosing, um... Um, um, okay, I'll take, yeah, I'm going to take the kid with the cast. And the other team, oh, geez, we'll take Rodney. Okay, so that's sort of how it felt. We're standing there, and I'm hoping that somebody is going to choose me. Please choose me. Pick me, pick me. And we're standing, we're going through, and they say, Rodney Sisko. I'm thinking, please, Lord, let there be a family. Rappinchuk family. Now, the Rappinchuk family, Pa Rappinchuk is a child of Russian immigrants. Ma is a child of Swedish immigrants. Um, No family more different from who I am and how I was raised. Pa is as conservative as you get and can just sometimes say things you go, what? But that same little girl with that broken wrist, their daughter. And here's what becomes funny. What most students engaged with was one or two times that they went to their family and that was it. Every time I needed to get off campus, when I just said I need a home-cooked meal, Ma and Pa, and they were there. When I tore the cartilage in my left knee, I was in surgery, and my mother couldn't fly from Philly to be here, Ma was in the hospital room with me. When I got back to practice, went through everything, rehab, yay, I'm allowed to wrestle, tore the cartilage in my right knee and went back to surgery, Ma and Pa were in the hospital with me. When I returned to college my sophomore year and got a phone call and Tom said, their son, hey, Ma's in the hospital, I was there with them. Because what ended up happening is that we weren't just neighbors, we became family. And one of the things that happens when you start connecting with someone who's very different from you is you start asking questions of who are they and who am I and how do we learn together? And that family is still my family today. If ever you're in my office, you will have seen Pa Rappenchuk pop in every once in a blue moon. And he's like, if, if you ever pop in, he'll tell you that you have on two different shoes, and you'll look down and you'll go, no, I don't. And he'll say, yes, you do, a left and a right one. He'll tell you you have, <laughs> he'll tell you, you have holes in your pants, and you won't say, no, I don't. And he'll say, well, where'd you put your legs in? Um, <laughs> he'll ask you if you want to see his little gift, which Ma gave to him, and open up something that well, plastic mouse jumps right out at you. Um, 
But as family, we became something unique together. But what it required is this sense of humility, allowing him to step into my life, allowing them to step into my life, and to be living neighbors to me. Humility, however, is a challenge because it is uncomfortable. Humility is an interesting place that we talk about for your learning because humility recognizes in this age that there's a tempting sense of empowerment from being people of information. And we misplace information and understand and understanding and think that that is knowledge, and it's not. You, right now, we, we've lost the subtlety of taking time to really study things because we can quickly Google it. Or it, my wife and I were watching some show and this guy said, I binged it. And I was like, that's not a thing, don't even try. <laughs> But a mind properly observant to what God is doing is humble and is waiting to say, Lord, tell me about myself and tell me about others. In his book, um, Good to Great, Jim Collins writes about how organizations move from being good to great and being focused on, not only being focused on hiring the right people, uh, confronting brutal facts and developing a culture of discipline, Collins describes the organizations were led by unique individuals. He called them these special level five leaders. And these level five leaders had a way of interacting, which is sort of the way we talk about with our leaders. A good level five leader focuses when there is crap coming about their organization, they are the shield. They are the one that says, it's all my fault, I will take responsibility for it. But when there's praise coming to the organization, they get out of the way and let the praise go to everybody else in the organization. There's a sense of humility, of understanding that the team does well if we recognize that each person in this team is important, valuable, and is going to do something amazing. We're reflecting on the book, Good to Great, and thinking about who we are as Christ's church, and reflecting that we are connecting with our neighbors, people who are different. There are a couple of thoughts that are important to look at. First, we need to know ourselves. We need to understand exactly who we are. Take a look in the mirror and say, Lord, who is this person that you've made? What are their gifts? What are their talents? So now for you as students, that means you might want to do some assessment of what are your gifts, talents, skills, and some of the understanding of things that you're struggling with. The second piece is that we need to appreciate others. And not just this, oh, I appreciate you, but really value and recognize that every person around you is uniquely made in the image of God, which is real easy when we're here. But it's also the person who is smelly and weird and comes up to you in a funny way when you're sitting at whatever, your Starbucks or someplace like that. It is the person who comes from a background very different from yours, who thinks, speaks, acts, interacts, and does things very different from you, who is loud and is brash and is in your face and their breath stinks. That person is also made in the image of God, and you need to be able to appreciate them. Take risks. Taking risk means that you step out of what is comfortable to you and find out about someone who is different from you. Taking risk means that you try things that you've never tried before, and sometimes, frankly, you fail at them. So I'm going to try going away on a breakaway ministry trip, and I'm going to be a messenger of the gospel, and I may not do it all perfectly, but I'm going to see God at work. And in those areas that I mess up, I'm going to learn. Learn continually. I think when I was young, I used to think, yes, I'm going to get grown and I'm going to know. Yeah, well, I'm older. I'm not grown yet. I'm still growing. And I'm still in the process of knowing. And so are you. Understanding what it is to recognize who is our neighbor is understanding what it is to continually ask, Lord, teach me about you and teach me about the people around me and give back. Giving back means that you use your time, your talents, your treasures and you use them in the way that honors the Lord. Humility means that you are recognizing that you have something to give to the Lord and you have something to give to others. The example that we have, of course, is Christ. Paul writes us that if there's any fellowship of, of love, if there's any, um, I should actually turn to it rather than trying to quote it because all of a sudden I'm not going to quote it perfectly, but If you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others as better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then he goes on talking about that beautiful picture of 
your attitude should be that as the same as Christ Jesus, explaining that being God and yet taking on human form. So we learn from each other. Understanding who our neighbor is is understanding that God has uniquely gifted us to serve him. Understanding who our neighborhood is is also understanding that God has uniquely gifted others to teach us and to be part of our lives. And humility means that we understand that we are going to have to work with people who are very different from ourselves, put ourselves in situations that are very uncomfortable, and yet expect God. So, who is our neighbor? Our neighbor is the one who is right next to us. Our neighbor is the one who's far from us. How do we learn through humility? I'll close with this final story. My son was with us at six years old at a McDonald's, and he looked and saw a man, and he said, Dad, that man needs to eat something. So my son got up and went over to the man and said, Do you want something to eat? And the gentleman said, I'd really love something. So he came back and told me the whole list of what we had to go buy for him and for his friends, so we went and purchased it. And Jabari, excuse me, this is Juwan, the older son. Juwan sat down with him for a minute and said, I hope you know that God loves you, but most importantly, I hope you are not hungry tonight. And Juwan came back over and sat down with us and went on about talking with us. That was his neighbor. But because Juwan did that, every time I see John, John comes up to talk to me. When I'm in the library, John's like, how you doing? I'm doing well, John, how are you? John, have you found some place to live in? No, brother, but don't worry, brother, because I'm in better places than some of the other people and God is still taking care of me. John speaks to me and reminds me of the faithfulness of the Lord out of a position of a man who's homeless. Why? Because he's our neighbor. He's my neighbor. And he's understood what humility is and how to teach me. May the Lord do the same in your life. Amen.